How many respiratory therapists do I have? Just one? Perfect. We're going to play a game and you can't win. Um, how many intensivists, people work in ICU, manage ventilators regularly? Perfect. ER doctors that have prolonged hold times that keep managing ventilators. Paramedics, pre-hospital staff who do everything that I do in a closet. I see some hands up still. We're going to find out who has the most ventilator knowledge. This is a very easy quiz. This quiz only has two questions. And if you get them right at the happy hour later, I will buy you a round of the libation of your choice. Very easy quiz. Two questions. First question. What do these initials stand for? Who can tell me what all these initials stand for? Every one of them. That's the first question. Who's got all of these? And now who can explain? You got to tell me the words that go with every letter and then explain how each one of these work. What's actually going on with your machine when you put these, put these vent modes into practice? Who's got me? Anybody? This has gotten ridiculous. Do y'all agree? Like this has gotten ridiculous. And you get online and you're trying to learn about ventilators and you're seeing all these initials and you're learning about all these novel modes. This evokes imposter syndrome in me. I'm like, I don't know enough about ventilators because I don't know what VAPS is and I've never used that before. Oh, it's volume assured pressure support. What does that mean? How do I use it? It's gotten out of hand. It's gotten out of hand and it's keeping a lot of people from exploring how to manage a ventilator. And furthermore, it's making us miss the fundamentals of ventilator management. The things we know that matter, we're not doing because we're so focused on these funny letters. When I went to RT school 20 years ago, um, it was easy. This was it. And it didn't matter what brand of ventilator you had. These were your modes. And you learned these four, and you were good. You were great. You could manage any vent that was out on the market. And then all of a sudden, hey, I'm not setting peak flow anymore. I'm setting eye time. Why am I doing that? Oh, well, that's PRVC. Cool. What's PRVC? Well, this manufacturer over here, they want to sell their machine. So they came up with their own term. And several manufacturers used PRVC, several used VC plus, you know, some said auto flow, this APCV, and all of a sudden I've got four different names for the same thing, but they were still kind of the same thing. And we could still kind of figure them out if we understood what PRVC was. Well, now we're getting into closed loop ventilation systems where the vent is doing more of our thinking for us and we're putting less information in. And sure enough, we can't have one mode that every ventilator can use. Instead, each company has their proprietary mode because they want to sell their ventilator and everyone does something a little bit different. Um, and it's making it more confusing. And one, people are, they're not trying to learn the ventilator anymore. They're just seeing it as this thing. Oh, I can't understand it. But two, worse than that is they've lost their fundamentals. They're not doing the fundamentals. They're so focused on these numbers and these letters that they've lost the things that we know actually matter. So let's talk about the things that actually matter that we should focus on when we manage a ventilator. What do y'all think? What's an important aspect of ventilator management of our settings that we should focus on? Volume, title, I love it. I love that that was, I love that was the first thing that was said. And all y'all shouted that out. So y'all know this, right? We're doing a good job with this, right? We're actually not. We're still not doing a good job on this. Ardsnet came out in the late 90s, early 2000s. We've known this for a while. And yet 40% of our patients are still being put on an inappropriately large tidal volume. They're still being put on tidal volumes greater than 8 mLs per kg. And we're over here trying to figure out this closed loop ventilation system, trying to figure out how it works, putting on patients on tidal volumes that are harmful to them. And when you look at these retrospective studies, not only are 40% of our patients being put on inappropriately high tidal volumes, those patients' mortality is higher. This is still killing patients. Keep it simple. When you teach mechanical ventilation to your trainees or you're learning mechanical ventilation, start with this. Start with this. And secondly, everyone in here knows, right? 8 mLs per kg, we should go less than that. Actually, make sure you're doing it. Sorry to butt in here, but if you made this far in the video, I'm willing to bet a large sum of money that you're enjoying the content. And if you're enjoying the content, you're going to love the complete Resus X 2025 conference, the live in Philadelphia a couple months ago. We have the rock stars of resuscitation, three days of content, and we have CME and CEU for you to earn. So why not head over to the link right there in the caption, sign up now because we're having an end of your sale and I think you're gonna enjoy it. Okay, enough of me, back to the video. Uh, 
Short patients, your shorter folks, shorter patients are at much higher risk of getting inappropriately large tidal volume. And then I took this graph, I intentionally cut the labels off of it. You can see the red bell curve slightly shifted to the right there of the higher tidal volumes. Who do you think fits in the red bell curve? Red and blue, that's a hint. Females, female patients. Female patients are getting inappropriately high tidal volumes. All of you know, all of you know, that's the first thing you shouted out was tidal volume. All of you know that eight mLs per kg is my max. Make sure you're doing it. Go back to one of these guys. Go back to one of these guys. You can get these on Amazon for nothing, nothing. And the sewing tape measures, they typically only go to five feet. That's fine. You can guesstimate the last six to 18 inches a lot better than you know, these numbers. Oh, they're, they're about my height, right? Measure your patient. Get an accurate height on them so that you know you're getting an accurate tidal volume. This is, I know that I'm going on and on and on about this, and this is so elementary, and you all know this. 40% is a big number that we are still screwing up based off of 20-year-old data. Measure your patients. If you have a short patient, if you have an obese patient, if you have a female patient, definitely measure them. Those are the ones that we are screwing up the most. The second aspect of mechanical ventilation that we've got to get right is your oxygen status. Keep them norm oxemic. Keep them norm oxemic. This is not revolutionary. This is not something new. But when you look at what we're doing with this, we're still allowing almost 80% of our patients to become hyperoxic. The avoidance of hyperoxia is not a new thing. When I launched my first website back in 2018, I had a whole section dedicated to this. And this is the study I cited back then, and I like it. It's one of my favorites. Because this looked at patients, the ABG that was done in the ER, the initial ABG only. One ABG, a short amount of time of hyperoxia, and that was associated with increase in mortality. And the higher it went, the higher mortality went. I love this one, but it's an observational study. Here's kind of the, the RCT that hopefully changed all of our practices, the oxygen ICU trial, which again, prospective randomized control trial that showed us the harms of hyperoxia. Um, and I do think that for a while we swung too far in the other direction and we're like, hey, I'd rather a PAO2 of 50 rather than a PAO2 of 120. You know, this was another really good RCT that instead of looking at hyperoxia, looked at low normal to low versus high normal to slightly high. And, and this one redemonstrated that there is a pretty decent safe landing area. Um, hypoxemia is bad, right? But extreme hyperoxia is bad. There's kind of a U-shaped curve uh, where we have kind of a flat part at the top, which is probably our safe landing area. When you look at the literature, there is some movement in this either way. Here is my safe landing area that I think you should shoot for on your ABG. Give me a PAO2 between 75 and 120. That's a pretty wide landing area. We can hit that, right? We can hit that. 75 to 120. Never let your PAO2 get to above 200. That is the steep drop off. That is where survival just really plummets when you get over 200. Avoid hyperoxia. Before you worry about all those fancy modes, sorry, I got in your picture there. Uh, actually, here, give me the picture. Go ahead. Perfect. Tag me on Instagram. Hey, Steve MD. Uh, there is a safe landing area. Don't go above 200. Um, there is a couple of, there's a secret vent setting. I, I don't know if you know your ventilators do this or not. You actually, you don't have to start them on 100%. I know, right? That's crazy. You don't have to start them on 100%. When I grew up, everybody started on 100%. You drop down by 10% every hour. Don't do that. Whatever FiO2 they are on before you intubate them, put them on that. If they're chilling on room air, I promise you, your vents can do this. You probably don't know this. Your ventilator can go down to 21%. That is an actual setting on the ventilator. Um, I've seen it. It actually works. Try it on your vent at home. Don't give them oxygen they don't need. Start low. Start whatever they're on before you intubate them. If they are on a non-invasive ventilator at 100%, satin 87, yes. Start them on 100%. Otherwise, if they're chilling on a two liter nasal cannula, satin 95, start them on 30%. Avoid hyperoxia. 
And then my last point, fortunately, was just made by me for these fine gentlemen on the couch. When your patient starts getting into severe ARDS, consider proning. Uh, consider proning. Now, the caveats on proning, these guys talked about, I heard a little bit backstage. The PF ratio needs to be less than 150 for it to make a difference. This is a lot of work. This is a lot of work. This, this takes a lot. But when your PA, PF ratio gets in that severe ARDS range, consider proning. Oh, one slide behind. And, and then secondly, for this to actually make a difference, you need to have them on their belly at least 12 hours of the day. More than half of the day needs to be spent prone on their belly. Um, I, If you are freaked out by all these vent modes, if you have that imposter syndrome flaring up, hey, I don't understand ASV. I, I don't understand what we're doing with the vent. I just can't manage vents. First of all, no, do the basics right. Do the fundamentals right. If you want to learn more about these nuances, is, and this is important, we can wean them a little bit quicker. There's some advantages to these newer modes. Um, we've got a phenomenal event conference that sold out really quick. So all of you that wanted tickets that weren't able to come Thursday and Friday, I do apologize. We're going to do that again. I want people to be better managers of the ventilator. But before you start that conference, everybody that's coming on Thursday and Friday, before you get there, get your tidal volumes down. Get your oxygen sats down. And if they need to be prone, flip them on their belly. Guys, that's all I have. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.